shall we roll? So, um, um, our real Dean makes a point of, whenever he can, attending inaugural addresses by new professors. He is unavoidably unable to be here today, so sends his apologies, and he has asked me to deputise. Uh, so my name is Douglas Ellis, um, and I'm uh, the Deputy Dean, and it's a particular pleasure for me to uh, introduce my colleague, the Professor Virginia Brown. <laughs> Perhaps I should leave it at that. Uh, <laughs> except to... Uh, to, uh, to uh, to apologise to her for years, I thought that her name was pronounced Braun, and I've had this wrong forever, but she's corrected me. Uh, so, Jenny Brown was uh, an Auckland um, undergraduate and MA uh, psychology student and went on to win a Commonwealth uh, scholarship to go to Loughborough University in the UK to do her PhD. She returned to us as a lecturer in 2001, so this is a pretty rapid rise to professorship, and she's been here. Yeah, it, it's good, isn't it? <laughs> I'm impressed too. Um, <laughs> um, uh, and of course she's uh, spent various uh, periods of, of, of leave at other places, uh, the University of the West of England, Columbia University and the City University of New York, and uh, as I recall sometime teaching in Tehran, in Iran, which causes her considerable uh, passport difficulties in the, the current era these days. So she's interested in uh, knowledge at the nexus of the scientific, the socio-cultural, the popular, and the personal. She's, uh, um, you'll hear a lot about all those things tonight, I think. She's uh, a, a feminist and critical psychologist, and many of her more than 100 papers concern gender, body, sex, sexuality, and health. But a second line of, of research that she's, <coughs> of uh, scholarship that she's engaged in is about qualitative research in general, and in particular thematic analysis, her book, Successful Qualitative Research, A Guide for Beginners. Practical Guide, Practical for, Begin guide for Beginners. That's a Practical Guide for Beginners. There's a bit I didn't write down. Uh, received the uh, Distinguished Publication Award from the US Association for Women in Psychology. And her paper, you know, applaud in a minute here, um, her paper on thematic analysis with Victoria Clark is, not quite yet, is by a factor of two the most cited publication by any Auckland academic uh, with more than... Uh, <laughs> with nearly 30,000 uh, um, citations. Incidentally, uh, the next most, uh, most heavily cited is uh, Dave Krofchek's paper on the Higgs boson, and the range of these two things, I think, nicely um, um, illustrates the strength that our faculty takes and the pride that we take in the range and variety and diversity of uh, scholarship on offer within the faculty. Uh, Ginny was also uh, co-editor for seven years of feminism and psychology, and I think a founding editor. Mm -hmm. Oh, not quite a founding editor. Not she's that not, old. She's not a fan of it, is it? So we're going to take the professorship off her now. <laughs> <laughs> and for this, I've got to read this one out carefully. Uh, for, for which uh, that journal received the award for distinguished leadership on behalf of women in psychology from the Committee on Women in Psychology of the American Psychological Association in 2013, which is a great honour. So with all of that expertise, she was a natural choice for the new position that we established relatively recently of Associate Dean Equity in the Faculty of Science. We're very proud of Ginny and looking forward to hearing what she has to say tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. That may preempt some of my points I'm going to make. In a mana, in a tini toto, in a kaimanake o tene fariwananga, tena koto katoa. He maha aku toto. He ingarangi, he koti mana, he tia mana, he airihi, he wiwi o kutipuna. Nor hokianga aho. Ke tamaki makoro toku kainga. Ko Penny Johnston toku mama. Ko Peter Brown toku papa. Ko Snail toku papa fangai. Ko David, toku papa whāngai. <laughs> ko Ginny, toku ingoa. It is a great privilege to stand here, to feel I belong in this space and place. And I acknowledge Ngāti Whātua ki ō as kaitiakari of this land in that privilege. 
I am humbled and somewhat relieved, I have to say, after all the apologies I received today, um, that you are all here to hear my thoughts. And I hope that there'll be at least something for everyone. So welcome and thank you for coming. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. I vividly remember the cold November morning when I woke to find the world had sheared sideways, or maybe backwards, or both. After eventually going to sleep late, reassured via a chat with a friend in New York that it was going to be okay, the first thing I saw when I awoke a few hours later was the New York Times alert that Trump had won. Whoa, let's go forwards on the slides. There, there we are, Trump had won. It's not an overstatement to say that my shock was visceral, much like it had been with Brexit sometime earlier, but more so. And not just because I'm one of the out of touch liberal elite. I may be, but more on that later. The visceral shock came from the sense that again, values so fundamentally opposite to my own seem to have won. Hate it seemed had triumphed. And I know that that claim that this was about hate has been disputed, but let's just park that. It seemed like the good world that I had always implicitly imagined us working towards, despite various evidence to the contrary, um, had not just scurried, but actually sprinted into the shadows. I walked to my conference in a state of shock. The fact that it was a gender summit, focusing on gender equity in STEM, science, technology, engineering and maths for those non-science people, was not lost on me. The US had voted in a president whose gender politics can be described as dubious at best, and who is also profoundly anti-science. I'll bracket off the critiques of these marches around lack of diversity and inclusivity, but we'll come back again to the question of politics and knowledge, and to the questions of who gets to be in the room, and whose science, and whose knowledge is it, is, is it that we're talking about. I will argue that we cannot separate the personal from the political from knowledge, and nor should we want to. The contrast with day one of the conference, with the palpable energy after we'd started in the European Parliament, and who wouldn't take a selfie, right? <laughs> um, was stark. The conference felt muted, stunned. Many speakers acknowledged the election. To do so, or to not do so, would have seemed remiss somehow. Now, I was aware that Trump's election affected me in indirect ways, through his politics and the way he would shape the world. <laughs> I was aware as a woman and a feminist that many things I valued personally and politically would be under attack from Trump's election. I was aware that Trump's election affected me through the impact it had on friends in the US uh, who occupy identities directly under attack within his rhetoric and as we've now seen his policies, people I love and care about and people they love and care about. What I wasn't aware at the time was the way Trump's election has affected my experience around being a scholar. Not in obvious ways, but in profoundly unsettling and quite existential ways. So today, which coincidentally, in the US at least, was Trump's birthday, <laughs> I decided to focus on what it means to me to be a critical scholar, a critical social scientist in the current era. I was given pause to question my orienting this talk around Trump, and don't worry, it's not all going to be about him, um, when reading of a Princeton professor who recently cancelled a talk due to death threats after they had criticised Trump in a commencement address. We live in troubling times. And yet, my vulnerabilities here are not deep. I am flying to the US in two weeks, and Doug's alluded to my visa issues, so we'll see how that goes. But my pause was only brief. Many scholars have spoken up against Trump's flexible position on truth, his alternative facts or lies. Um, some have argued for the power of the truth, and it's really not hard to be, it's hard not to be drawn instantly to such a powerful full-page statement from the New York Times to go yes and pump your fist like a male tennis player who's just won at Wimbledon. <laughs> Others have reiterated the value of facts but at the same time recognising that facts or truth are not really the point. We're in a battle over whose story counts, whose truth counts. This is where I'll come back to the intersections around knowledge. What counts? Who counts? And what might it mean to me being an academic, critical scholar at a university in Aotearoa right now? 
Massey politics professor Richard Shaw, who highlighted that Trump's tenuous relationship with the truth, bludgeoning disregard of evidence, an argument with which it disagrees, and antediluvian views on the nature and role of science are deeply problematic stated in this commentary that the role of a university is to create and publicly disseminate knowledge of the human condition and the world in which we live. And that this requires openness to different points of view, acceptance that knowledge is best pursued in a systematic manner, and a willingness to be proven wrong. Yes, fist pump moment. But is he talking about what I'm talking about? My alternative title for this talk was Trump stole my ontology. <laughs> I thought that would pull a crowd of zero, but maybe from the last <laughs> not. You can relax even though you're a captive audience. I'll mostly leave theory to one side. But very basically, ontology is concerned with how we think about reality, about truth, and for researchers, how we conceptualize what it is that we study, what we think we're able to get at and understand and how, and why we think this matters. For the things I study, mostly related to gendered bodies, sex and sexuality, and health, I ask what reality is being made here? What is being made possible? What is being made impossible? What stories about things are becoming truths, and how can we interrupt that? Facts are interesting, but they are not my currency. Stories are. Stories, but based on good analysis. Trump stole my ontology because he suddenly made being a scholar who doesn't believe in truth with a capital T, whose currency is not facts, a much more precarious thing than it had been before. Maybe even a politically irresponsible thing, an indefensible thing. I'm going to argue that critical scholarship isn't indefensible and probably isn't irresponsible, though we probably always are in moments of complicity even as we critique. I'm going to reflect on what it now means to be a critical scholar, to be a scholar for whom truth is not simple, and whose knowledge frameworks have been undermined by the rise of alternative facts. The ontologies and epistemologies that underpin my work, the ideas about reality, and what counts as knowledge, about what my task is as a scholar, risk being aligned with the position on truth that Trump displays. We critical scholars, or scholars who support different knowledge and truth frameworks than the mainstream scientific model, or the wider popular cultural common sense about what counts as knowledge, though this is changing, we were already in a complex place of raising our voices seemingly against science. The context of that task is quite different now. Now these battles around truth and validity have tentacles that grip deep into scholarly and social history. Some colleagues who work with Mato Ranga Māori, for instance, still have battles to claim validity for indigenous knowledge frameworks. We had our very own crisis in social psychology around knowledge and validity decades ago. So these are not unfamiliar questions to many of us. But to me, as the scholar I am and the positions I occupy, it feels like the ground has shifted, an unsettling, not unlike an earthquake. Previously, I considered being post-truth, in a singular sense, a position I occupied happily, not without threat. I've alluded to the crisis in social psychology and debates about ontology, epistemology and validity still go on, but now it's complicated. So the election of Trump threw me into a potentially endless academic existential spin. Now, you may wonder why I chose this picture, but in my alternative fantasy career, I'd be an astronaut, so I couldn't resist. Eight months ago, this inaugural would have been a quite different beast. But tonight, I aim to weave together a range of different strands, using this moment to reflect on myself as a scholar, where I've come from, the scholarship I do, and why critical scholarship matters even now, maybe especially now. And because I don't think we can ever separate out the person, the political, and the socio-cultural from what we do, especially for critical social scientists, as I'm more about subjectivity than objectivity, 
this talk will be personal. You could argue it's actually going to be an extended justification for what I do, but that has become a really complicated question. How do I justify a critical scholarship that focus on sometimes apparently trivial matters, frivolous matters, the making and unmaking of sex, gender, sexuality, gendered bodies and health, in times like these, when material brutalities impact in ongoing ways in the lives of so many. New Zealand's shockingly unacceptable rates of violence, and particularly sexual and domestic violence, our increasing poverty and the ripple out effects associated with that in the intersections with gender and race, our ongoing colonial context and all sorts of manifestations of racism and implicit as well as explicit Pākehā norms that produce ongoing entrenched inequities and injustices and which impede well-being and tino rangatira tanga for tangata whenua, our shocking and heartbreaking mental health and suicide statistics. And that's just a start and that's just here, climate change and its impact on our Pacific neighbours, the worldwide refugee crisis. We live in troubling times, both locally and globally. With such pressing and punishing issues, how can I justify a critical scholarship and especially scholarship that doesn't aim to provide solutions, especially not easy solutions? I don't know if I can fully, but unmaking is part of remaking which is necessary for change. And within a whole system of scholarship, many different voices, approaches, and perspectives can not only be useful, but vital. When I look back across my career, a key thread is going against the grain. I couldn't believe it when I found this bumper thing. Many, many years ago, as you might pick up from the picture. So I stand here before you, and I don't look that much of a rebel. Now, in case you're doubting me, I Google image search. Google, of course, being the answer for everything. Definitely not me. <laughs> Rebellion, as constructed by Google Images at least, is all masculine male. I look and sound educated. Pākehā, middle class. I look and sound privileged one of the liberal elite currently under attack, but who are also sometimes fighting back. I am indeed those things. Educated, Pākehā, middle class, privileged. But that's only part of the story, and what it conceals is as relevant to me as a scholar as what it reveals. I was born into an era of protest, anti-war, anti-nuclear, women's rights, land rights. My earliest memories are of protest. My mother, who was a true rebel, unlike me, a black sheep in her farming family, socially politically committed to left social justice causes, took me along at least sometimes, engaging me in politics from early on, instilling the idea that we can and should try to change our worlds. But then she took me out of that world. Aged four, we left semi-normal society for life on a remote hippie commune in the beautiful Hokianga Hills. My normal, which I came to know was most definitely not the normal, became a truly countercultural life for at least the next eight years. Remote meant no road access, about a 30 minute walk in into these hills. It meant most of the dwellings, at least at first, had dirt floors, no running water, certainly no electricity. It meant cooking over open fires. It meant no car, semi-self-sufficiency, and a commitment to an anti-materialist life. Now those who know how many boxes my currently being renovated home holds will laugh at that last point. It meant a childhood without the popular cultural references of my peers. Do not ask me anything about the 70s and 80s. And I wonder if that's why I find popular culture so fascinating now. It meant poverty. A bag of caramel popcorn was a highlight of one Christmas and I took weeks to eat it. It was probably disgusting, but I treasured it. As a child, I couldn't imagine buying new clothes 
or shoes. I vividly recall hearing a com casual comment about friends who had stayed in a motel on a trip and wondered if I would ever stay in a motel. It seemed as unlikely and as desirable as my fantasy alternative career of being an astronaut. And everyone here who travels to work will probably appreciate the irony of that. This isn't a woe was me trip down memory lane. Telling our personal stories, examining ourselves, the practice of reflexivity has to have a purpose. I am interested in my story of getting to be here for two reasons. To ask what it can tell me about myself as a scholar, and because I care about issues of justice and change and inclusivity and participation within education. On the second point, my question is, how does this girl get to be this woman standing here today, embodying a seemingly very different reality to the one I've just described? What my story of childhood poverty obscures is the richness and social capital that nonetheless featured. My father, not an active part of my childhood, was a university lecturer in maths. I knew that being a lecturer was something you could be. I knew that doing a PhD was a thing. My mother, also tertiary educated, had been and was again later a teacher. I hated school. I was bullied. We hippie kids occupied the lowest rung in what felt to me like a clear tripartite social hierarchy. The so described redneck Pakeha kids on the top, the normal kids, uh, the Māori kids, the population majority in the middle, and us mostly Pakeha hippie kids at the bottom. Of course it's more complex than that, but that's what it felt like. No one wanted to be our friends, we didn't even want to be each other's friends at school. <laughs> And I tell this not as part of some oppression Olympics where I claim to really be more oppressed than other people, but because it framed my formal educational encounters. In that context, a decile one school, my teachers by and large didn't engage me. It didn't feel like my place. I didn't feel like I belonged. Even so, I experienced some agency around education. On the occasions I resisted or refused to go to school, I wasn't forced. When I found my primary school reports in my 20s, I was shocked at just how poor my attendance actually was. <laughs> By myself, however, I read voraciously, and I lived in a creative and socio-politically engaged environment, encouraged to be practical, inquisitive, and independent. I made lifelong hippie kid friendships. And Kura, I am delighted, wherever you are, <laughs> um, that you have made it here. Um, and I know that the rest of your whanau who want to be here are here in spirit. Mum and I moved to Auckland just before my teens. Despite a desperate adolescent wish to be normal, <laughs> it was never meant to be. Mum was teaching it and I went to a Steiner school. My non-mainstream education there again encouraged independent learning, inquisitiveness and creativity. Through non-specialisation, that education encouraged thinking in non-strictly disciplinary limited ways. I loved school then and, lim and learned in that context to love learning. My teachers engaged me and I lucked into a particularly academically inclined class. Yet when I finished school, I didn't come to university. I was undecided about the future, enjoying being a skateboarder, one of just two girl skaters in Auckland at the time. See. <laughs> really a rebel <laughs> and I chose instead to work in an alternative skate shop Blue Tail Lounge for those of you who miss it still. University was hard to imagine it felt foreign removed but I got to uni a year later bored and having decided I wanted to be a clinical psychologist of course. <laughs> Starting as an undergraduate uni was confounding I was lost, bewildered, overwhelmed. I had no people here, but when I found them, that made the difference. For the very first, what grabbed me in psych was the critical, the feminist, the ideas and approaches that pushed boundaries, that sought connections between knowledge and the socio-political. 
At the end of my second year, I hounded my now colleague Nicola Gavey into supervising an independent research project. She hadn't planned to give one, but she allowed me to convince her. And that I am forever grateful for. I'd pretty much given away clinical at that point. Knowledge was what enchanted me. And still, at the end of my BA, I left overseas, drawn by the obligatory middle-class Pākehā OE. Well, drawn as far as Melbourne, where the plan was to work and earn money to be able to afford an OE. I mention this because I wasn't committed to academia. It was a possibility, not an inevitability. There are, there are so many tenuous moments in a career that looks from the outside so seamless that it must be planned. I was brought back by the offer of a master's scholarship. For a kid like me, without financial resources, without parents who could support any tertiary study, and in a context of user pays education, this was what made the difference. If we want to facilitate the education of kids from non-traditional backgrounds, Māori kids, kids from equity groups, poor kids, into extended tertiary study, which I do, we have to look at the enablers and the retainers. What gets those kids in our doors and what keeps them there? We are, of course, looking at this as a faculty and a university, but in my experience, it was money. That scholarship meant I could choose to stay and make this my place. Money matters. By the time I started postgraduate study, I had a sense of belonging within the university, a sense that this could be my place. That belonging was mostly based in the pleasure of intellectual pursuits as well as an easy fit between the Pākehā middle class values and individualised identity I embodied and the spaces and places of this institution. S these spaces are implicitly classed and raced and gendered among other things, which challenges belonging for many of those we would want to belong. A Commonwealth scholarship to do my doctorate in social sciences at Loughborough University in England made another previously impossible pathway possible. It was an incredible, expanding experience with many outstanding doctoral student peers, mentors and scholars, including my doctoral supervisors, the renowned feminist psychologists Sue Wilkinson and Celia Kitzinger. An inaugural is such a focus on the individual, but the many people colleagues, Vano, friends, students, mentors, who have inspired, shaped, prodded, and pulled me, are the invisible cloak that surrounds my career. I can't acknowledge everyone in this talk by name, but I want to especially acknowledge my PhD comrade in arms, and now regular collaborator, Victoria Clark. This year, we reached the dizzying career heights of being cartoonified, <laughs> wearing matching feminist killjoy necklaces. <laughs> I doubt PBRF will value that as much as I do. Victoria is one of those scholars whose fierce intellect doesn't let you get away with sloppy thinking, who also goes against the grain. Our collaboration as co-authors began when we wrote on my first sabbatical a methodology paper that both synthesised some of our frustrations with qualitative research and offered something new. We wrote this because I was burned out and in meltdown and it felt achievable and even possibly fun. It was fun. To our surprise, it went on to do the academic equivalent of going viral, as Doug has suggested, for better, and Kerry, you'll be happy to hear me say this, sometimes for worse. <laughs> Leading us both into an unanticipated and ongoing field of scholarly endeavour, writing and thinking about qualitative researching. This aspect of my scholarship has had the most impact globally, shaping the scholarship of others. I find it easy to dismiss this, but scholars whose knowledge approaches may be under contestation need to do robust work. Talking about method, methodology, and knowledge and purpose is a part of that. I note, too, that this faculty features strongly as a global contributor to this aspect of scholarship. Ross Ihaka in statistics through developing R, for example. My amazing psych now colleague, Margie Wetherill. 
although not developed here, the significance and substance of her contribution to discourse analysis and psychosocial researching, as well as the deeper questions about what we're actually doing in social psychology, cannot be underestimated. I'm not staking a claim to a place at their table. I mean, they both have Wikipedia entries, which <laughs> I don't. <laughs> if anyone wants to make one. Um, but it's interesting to notice when we often focus on and value what we find rather than the how we find it. Both in academia and more widely, the place and role of the university and us within it is a hot topic of critical conversation right now. This focus is grounded in recognition that the world has sheared sideways and that our contexts are challenging ones. Many of us have much privilege in still having some freedom to defend values and scholarship which might be under threat. With increasing pressure on less obviously applied disciplines, we need to continue to support the arts, humanities, critical thinking and knowledge seemingly for knowledge's sake, both to disrupt the narrative and because it's short-sighted not to do so. Our futures cannot fully be imagined from now. Recent times have seen much discussion about the employability of university graduates. That tends to look outwards rather than back at ourselves and ask what makes good future academics and indeed how we see those academics as contributing to the construction of a future, fairer, more just society. As we butt up against a time of seemingly increasing social division, a time of precarity in all sorts of ways, a time of alternative facts and post-truthness, I believe we need a community of scholars who are critical, who are questioning and who are rebels who ask uncomfortable questions and are encouraged to do so. Scholars who haven't taken the blue pill. <laughs> this analogy doesn't quite work with the red pill, the truth kind of thing, but stick with it. Scholars who support a multiplicity of located truths but recognise context in the various ways we might judge quality of different truths. Scholars like my former student and now colleague, Jade LeGrice, who is developing knowledge and practice for psychology grounded in Matauranga Māori, deploying indigenous, critical and decolonizing frameworks to push back against, to resist and challenge the dominant Pākehā, often deficit-based framings. And our implicit ideas about what counts as knowledge, which is linked to policy, practice, and indeed the construction, legitimation and delegitimation of different truths and realities, different imagined futures. Neoliberalism has brought all sorts of pressures and challenges, maybe I should say opportunities. <laughs> As scholars, we're increasingly encouraged to think in deliberate and strategic terms, to engage in planning activities. Where do you see yourself in five years, in 10 years, and so on? To be good neoliberal subjects, rational agents who manage our activities and our intellects according to an implicitly economically rationalized model. The ephemeral, the coincidental, the effective, and the random are sidelined or obscured. Those who know me well won't be surprised to hear me say, I hate this model. I'm hopeless at it, I never planned a career, and I don't make choices based on any strategy. I acknowledge the privilege in being able to both say and do that. I had a secure job straight out of my PhD. I have succeeded in that job, that I'm giving an inaugural makes it impossible to deny that, though it hasn't been without challenges and complications, and I want to thank the heads and deans who have been completely supportive, the colleagues who have gone above and beyond in their support, and my students who have been more than understanding. I want to disrupt the suggestion that individual success just reflects the talent of the individual. Far from it. I believe those of us in secure positions have some obligation to recognise and use that privilege to speak up and out, sometimes for, but ideally with, those who are less able to, but always in a way which recognises our positionality, our privilege, and keeps those open to interrogation, and to shut up when the time is right. 
Recognising that our worlds are constantly being made and to question that making, to interrupt or even stop that making, if it's working against social justice, against progressive agendas towards more inclusive and good world. To me, a good world is one characterised by less social division and inequality and more scope and support for people to be who they are in the myriad of ways they live their lives without harming others through assumption or direct action. So less harm, more opportunity, more valuing of diversity. That's why I couldn't start my talk any other way than with Trump. In New Zealand, speaking truth to power isn't just possibility, it's an obligation. The role of universities and academics within them to be critic and conscience of society is enshrined in law. This is so, these five words, critic and conscience of society, is one of the best things about academia in New Zealand to me, and others also agree. But I would say that, of course, because it fits my countercultural questioning the norm tendencies. It validates, provides a legitimizing framework for work which questions and challenges the status quo, which considers the implications of the shifts and changes from the micro to the macro in our society, our politics, our technologies, and our psychologies. Work which isn't directly applied. This sense of opportunity and obligation is why I value the equity work I do within the university, even if at the same time my constant travel companion is the question of how much my privileged position still inadvertently dominates or marginalises others. Recognising that despite my various experiences, as a Pākehā person coming from middle class social if not material capital, this place could become an easy fit for me. Important questions for this process are what makes belonging not only possible but likely for the different people who come through our doors. Oops. The university is having a role in making the common good linked to the way tertiary education is conceptualised and structured, and those two are intertwined, the material and the discursive go hand in hand, as either for personal gain, the dominant model in neoliberal contexts like our own, which fosters competition and often fails to disrupt social inequities in any substantial way, or as thought about as for a public or common good, a place through which social inequity can be challenged and which is less con connected to personal competition and advancement. This is an important part of the conversation, a continual unmaking of the norms that seep in. The norms that seep in. For the last part of this talk, I'll connect this to my topic-oriented research. Reflecting back as this talk gave me pause to do, I can see I'm interested in ontologies, in the production of realities, of realities for people, of the realities of bodies and sex and sexuality. But in terms of possibility, rather than thinking in a deterministic way, I don't map causal relationships between X and Y. I'm not interested in those. Humans are too complex. My colleague, Nicola Gavey, who, after my earlier successful hounding, supervised my master's thesis, encouraged me to go away and do a PhD, encouraged me to come back, and has been an exceptional mentor, colleague and friend, talks in her work about sexual coercion and rape of the cultural conditions of possibility. This is what I'm getting at and what I'm interested in understanding representation and practice, but to ask what they make possible, what they make difficult, unlikely, or impossible. I ask, how is this particular thing made sense of? What ideas does that rely on? What ideas does that reproduce? And what might the implications of that be? Language matters. Representation matters. It is not PC gone mad to care about these things. They are fundamental. The way we represent and talk about bodies and people and bits of our bodies create certain conditions of possibility around those bodies, around how we might feel about them and what we might do with them. Language and representation create truths. In the words of another inspiring colleague and mentor and friend, the scholar and activist Leon Ortifa, author of the first ever non-textbook I bought as an undergraduate, stretching my student loan, um, 
It matters whether our metaphors around sex are of digestion or of dancing, and in case you're wondering, it should be dancing. <laughs> so now to genitalia. This was going to be inevitable. You cannot spend the majority of your career studying genitalia and not talk about them in your inaugural. Initially, I had an apology, but that apology itself is part of the problem. An apology constructs genitalia is not quite right to talk about. Would a geologist apologise for talking about earthquakes? Someone may. <laughs> Maybe yes, who knows. So, genitalia. Just the other day, a friend sent me an IFL science story decrying a new product being sold for vaginal improvement. So-called oak galls, a sort of burr produced by the tree after a gall wasp inserts larvae into it. According to IFL, the popular crafty site Etsy had been selling this natural product, marketing it as an organic way to clean and heal and tighten the vagina. Apparently you insert it as a ground up paste and it stings um, <laughs> and works all sorts of wonders. This made media around the world, including here. No doubt because it was framed as somehow freakish. Who are these crazy people who buy such crazy remedies? But it is anything but random freak product. The problem it's being sold on, the problems it cures, are far from random. It would appeal to Gwyneth Paltrow. <laughs> she waxed lyrical about vaginal steaming in 2015 and the world media obsessed momentarily, mostly with cisgendered women trying it and reporting experiences from the transformative to the horrific. My then honours student Tycho Vandenberg and I analysed representations around vaginal steaming identifying the ways in which they rely on <laughs> and reproduce certain ideas about cisgender womanhood and female genitalia. For those unfamiliar with the term, cisgender, often abbreviated cis, refers to people whose birth sex and gendered identities match, in contrast to transgendered or gender non-binary or some intersex people. Despite various critiques, it has usefully been adopted to name and therefore disrupt the invisible norm. And as part of conceptual and political action to depathologize and demarginalize non-binary, fluid and transgender identities. To shift the common sense assumption that everyone is naturally or should be sex and gender aligned and discreetly so and forever. That common sense means that any other identity needs to be explained or accounted for, while cisgender people can live in blissful ignorance if they wish. This is not just semantic. The very high rates of violence experienced by trans and gender non-conforming people show the material impacts of how our society arranges itself. The use of a term is a way of recognising and naming the typically invisible privilege that goes along with fitting norms fitting the common sense assumptions that get articulated in society all of the time. It aligns with earlier theorising and practice that named straightness or whiteness or here Pākehā-ness, concepts that in societies we're more familiar and comfortable with but which still need work. Those gall wasps were but the latest in a very long line of diverse products designed to fix the problem that is the vagina. In the first half of the 20th century, women were marketed multiple detergent products like Lysol as a douche to resolve feminine hygiene issues and therefore ensure heterosexual marital fidelity through appropriate embodied and psychological femininity. The idea of the vagina or vulva as smelly is part of our socio-cultural narrative about these body parts. When I was doing my doctorate, looking at women's accounts and socio-cultural representations of the vagina, using the colloquial way to refer to everything down there, that title took me a very long time to come up with. <laughs> Some of the nastiest of the genital slang terms I collected and analysed evoked stinkiness. I won't repeat those terms here. But slang terms for penis and testicles did not evoke disgust or revulsion 
in nearly the same evocative way. What does it mean for people to grow up in a context where that truth is imparted through language and advertising? Women participants in my research exis- express perhaps the deepest anxiety about smell, and that isn't surprising. We've been told again and again that the vagina and vulva have a smell problem, and that this smell problem needs constant vigilance and that it needs to be dealt with. And we are still being told this. Socioculturally, to have a vagina and or a vulva is to have an always potentially defective body, an abject body. Now we could imagine such ads as responding to a problem. Maybe women really had or have poor hygiene and need a product to help them and their husbands, let's not forget about them. (laughs) Alternatively, we might read women's uptake of products through advertising as reflecting ignorance or the ignorance of the time. This idea of ignorance has some validity in terms of options for responding. It forms the basis for much health policy and practice, for instance, including sexuality education, both that informally online and that formally delivered, and is also imparted through various media. Yet another way to explain all this is that silly cis women unnecessarily worry about their vaginas. Just learn to love your body and it'll all be okay. The last decade or so has seen a slew of these love your vagina type online media. They are part of a wider movement towards information and acceptance. And it's hard not to be uh, be critical of that. However, in these, the problem and the solution are located in the hearts and minds of individual women. In the words of another inspiring colleague and friend, and a little bit earlier than me, Loughborough alum, Rosalind Gill, this completely exculpates wider culture and hostile surveillance of women's bodies. I am interested in a different story than these explanations. I am not interested in the question of whether or not people really need to use vaginal deodorizers or douche, though for the record they do not. (laughs) I want to know how are certain realities and truths produced in and through discourse and representation like this. I'm interested in what reality is being created here. I understand these products, marketing campaigns, media representations, discourses, as producing a reality in which the vagina can only be understood as potentially flawed, potentially always in need of attention, vigilance, and action. Products to fix the vagina or fix the vulva both rely on and reproduce the ontological state of the vagina a truth of potential or active defectiveness. Let's look at genital cosmetic surgery. In the last year of my PhD, the so-called designer vagina hit headlines. The 21st century started with this shiny new thing and almost every glossy women's magazine featured a story. The media frenzy partly resulted from two California-based surgeons who used PR consultants to sell the story and thus the procedures. Early accounts from surgeons who I interviewed in the media framed the surgery as uncomplicated and psychologically and sexually transformative. This story highlights an aspect that sometimes gets left out of critical and discourse work, the commercial. Genital distress is profitable. Many people are making money off genital distress. However, within the twin post-feminist and neoliberal discourses of because you're worth it and love your body, loving your vagina also becomes a site for profit. Remove your hair, vajazzle, remember that? (laughs) Bleach, dye your labia, steam, insert oak galls. The possibilities are endless. In the contemporary context where a neoliberal self-improving person has come to dominate our ideal of proper gendered personhood, Feminist concepts like empowerment have been co-opted into the work of selling, often selling products that rely on but also reinforce gendered embodied not quite rightness as an ontological state for women. We should care about things like oak calls and oak galls and vaginal steaming because not just cis women's genital and bodily distress and anxiety, our embodiment and affectivity have become a business opportunity with newly developed modes to sell solutions. Women are being sold at best and unnecessary and at worst risky 
product or service. But it goes deeper. Products and services that sell us solutions to genital distress do the work of truth production too. This ontologizing has potentially profound ramifications, leading to transformations in people's tastes, desires, preferences and practices for their consumptions. The very idea of who one can be and how one could or should act as a person with a vagina gets produced. What is one day unheard of may another day become culturally normative, unquestioned. Look at the rise in numbers having genital cosmetic surgery, and I think these are underestimates. Think of women in leg and underarm hair removal, normative, barely disrupted by feminist challenges despite moments and individuals, yet less than a century old. Norms are pesky things. I see disentangling, <laughs> understanding and challenging them, hopefully before they embed, as the task of my critical scholarship. But how, as a critical scholar, can I interrupt? What is our version of the science communication model for telling these alternative stories? Do the media provide the answer? As a critical scholar, I have a complicated position with media. If you work in areas like I do, it's easy but deeply problematic to position media as the enemy. This risks very reductionist and problematically simple causative models. I've done some work with Nicola Gavey and others around pornography. Pornography has become a quick fire scapegoat. Why do cis women get cosmetic surgery on their genitalia? They've seen too many vulvas in porn. Why is complete pubic hair removal now common among young cis women? Because it's commonplace in pornography and so on. I'm not gonna say that pornography has no relationship with how people feel about their bodies and what they do with their bodies, what their psychosexual and body defective responses and desires might be. Of course it can, and we're increasingly hearing about it. But that relationship is more complicated and nuanced than these simplified causative accounts suggest. Moreover, and Nicola will be pleased, I'm saying this because she's always pushing me to justify any claims to norms that I make. When we make such statements, we aren't just revealing truth or maybe misrepresenting truth, we are also constituting realities through language discourse and representation. As critical scholars, we are both truth breakers and truth makers through the stories that we ourselves tell. And let's not forget, these can be there can be, and there is, lots of fun in those activities of telling different stories. But what does this mean for engaging media? If we think the conversation matters this much, we need to be part of it as part of our critic and conscience role. It's easy to want to avoid, especially when we're hammered for using big and complicated words, although sometimes new words are necessary to make new things possible. Without recourse to facts, without simple truths, and when always telling a counter-normative story, however, it's not an is as easy a task as simply converting big words to little ones. But a few years ago, I attended the first ever World Congress of Cosmetogynecology as an incognito observer. <laughs> I coincidentally sat beside a journalist from Cosmopolitan who across the day got visibly more and more disturbed. I introduced myself, gave her my card, and suggested she get in touch if she wrote a story and wanted some alternative facts. <laughs> she did, and wrote a long and scoldingly brutal attack on the industry. That had impact. And it made me reassess and consider the ways my reluctance is somewhat of an abdication of responsibility, of telling critical stories and asking critical questions matter. So, the collision of two moments, promotion and the task of writing an inaugural in Trump's election, sent me into somewhat of a spin and have given me pause to reflect on quite different things than I anticipated. I get to the end of writing this talk and all the other narratives and points come crashing in and I want to write a different talk and then a different one all over again, but part of our skill should be knowing when to stop <coughs> and phew, you might think she's nearly at the end. I don't have the answers as to what being a critical scholar in trumped up times means, or whether I'll ever escape the edge of doubt that some retrenchment to facts and truth wouldn't be more beneficial. But if we really believe 
that the making of reality is a continual ongoing process, then we have to be its constant companions, unmaking realities at the same time as they're being made. We have to look for ways to promote the alternatives that we value. To quote the inspiring scholar and activist Michelle Fine, through pumping elaborated images of what could be. I teach my students that critical reflexivity is vital to being good qualitative researchers. It is also vital to being a critical scholar in the contemporary environment because values are always part of what we do, whether it's objectivity we're touting or, like me, subjectivity. <laughs> if we are to progress, I couldn't resist putting that in, I had to find a way. If we are to progress to a better, more socially just world, we have to be prepared to always question ourselves. Not believing in a singular truth helps that, I think. And being slightly unmoored, not quite belonging or fitting helps too. They make privilege never quite invisible. These are my perspectives. Where we come from shapes who we are, shapes what we see and don't see, shapes what we value and don't value. But we can also change those lenses. I was wondering how to finish. And I realized that all the people whose influence I have named are amazing, strong, and inspiring women. Psychology and Western society have a long history of women blaming, and especially mother blaming. And so in keeping with being countercultural, it seems fitting as a feminist scholar to end with a tribute to those women. Not in a gender essentializing way, not reinforcing some idea of inherent gender differences and gender binaries, but to acknowledge that throughout the contexts of growing up, studying, and being a scholar, it is mostly women who have facilitated, encouraged, pushed, and prodded, who have enabled me to be here today. And especially my mother, the rebel, who ensured I was in a lost cause to conventionality by raising me counterculturally to question norms and resist, to protest, and to go against the grain. I'll finish with a whakatoki I was sent today, which seemed also so apt for this finishing point, acknowledging the others, the women, who have enabled me to fly. Mate huru huru, ka rere te manu. Thank you.